Greetings, everyone, and welcome to our Kelly Appeal TV, where we discuss the appeal process and the federal um, appeal for the District of New York, as well as the Chicago trial coming up August 15th on our Kelly Appeal TV. So we have a motion. We have a new motion coming up. But before we get to that, I want to say thank everyone for helping us hit 300,000 views on YouTube. Totally awesome, a great opportunity for us here and getting the information out. So that's 300,000 people that know about the R. Kelly situation and the appeal from a positive perspective. So we really and truly are grateful for the viewers that comment, subscribe, that gives the views um, a chance and opportunity. So in, okay, you are now listening to the We Can Fly in July series. And this is just a pick me up, you know, from all the chaos and the crazy things that's going on in the world today regarding this, this case. So as of July 17th, 2022, there was a 14 page document that was sent um, in and through attorney Bongean for Robert Sylvester Kelly. So the, it was the United States District Court, Northern District of Illinois, Eastern Division, United States of America versus Robert Sylvester Kelly, also known as R. Kelly, Daryl McDavid and Milton Brown, also known as June Brown. This is number docketed 19 CR, five, six, seven to the Honorable D. Lion Weber. This was the response to the government's consolidated motions in limine by defendant Robert Sylvester Kelly. So now comes the defense um, that Robert Sylvester Kelly is about to put down through his counsel, Jennifer Bonjean, and the response to the government's consolidated motion in limine as follows. So remember, I read the document that the prosecution had put down with the rules and the guidelines of the protection order. Well, this follows it. So here we go. The introduction says the government's 40 page consolidated motion in limine Government's motion, or the motion, consists of 16 parts, some of which attempt to prevent Mr. Kelly from effectively confronting witnesses while uh, asking this court to preclude any possibility of a fair trial by flooding the proceedings with prejudicial propensity evidence. We'll talk about that after we're done with this portion. Where parts of the motion simply remind Mr. Kelly to follow the rules of evidence and provide notice that the government intends to try to prove its case, Mr. Kelly responds that he intends to abide by the rules and object as necessary, which he has that right. Mr. Ke Mr. Kelly objects to motion in limine numbers two, three, five, seven, eight, and 15 of the government's motion. Joins the motion with respect to number four, has no objection to numbers one or 11, and defers to the court on the remainder, reserving the right to object as necessary. And he responds to each part of the government's motion in turn. So let's look at some of the definitions that they've sent down. Let me see here. Okay, so the propensity or the prejudicial propensity evidence is defined as evidence of one crime that is used to show the defendant is more likely to have committed another crime. So that's what they're saying here, that in order for them to have a possible fair trial, it is you know, they're trying to set the stage that the flooding of information that they're trying to use to make sure that Mr. Kelly, that the government proves this case, 
Mr. Kelly responds that he intends to abide by these rules, but he has the option to object and he will object on anything that is not of importance to him, which he has that right. And I'm glad that he's taken the opportunity. He may not, uh, he may still plead the fifth. It's up to him. However, he has that right through attorney Bonjean to respond to objections where everything that he's putting on the books is to object for the purpose of a possible appeal later if it's if it's not in his best interest or if they're going too beyond the situation so let's go number one motion to protect the identities of minors one three four five and six. First, mr kelly has not has no objection to the alleged minors testifying using only their first names so that was part of the restraining order or to the minors mother minor number one's mother doing the same thing so it's okay use the first name mr kelly agrees to refer to them in kind so he's going to be respectful that said some of these individuals are already well known within the public domain so he wants to put that out there now before anything comes to the fruition minor one and her mother so it would be Rashonda Landfair and her mother are already public figures because of the previous case in which Mr. Kelly was acquitted. Is that Rashonda or is that Azriel? I'm not sure. So don't don't quote me on that. I'm not into all the, the details. I'm just reading this motion, trying to make sense of the legal terminology. I'm not really familiar 100% who is one, who is three, who is four, five or six. So. Forgive me for that. You can check another um, podcast for that. So Mr. Kelly agrees to refer to them in kind. That said, some of these individuals are already well known within the public domain. Minor one and her mother are already public figures because of the previous case in which Mr. Kelly was acquitted. So they already been there, done that with him, and they lost. So in addition, minor four, gave an interview to NBC's Dateline in 2019 and may well have made other statements to the media. It is not known to Mr. Kelly whether any of the other minors have had similar media involvement. So, hmm, that right there says he's putting it on the books. He's putting it out there now. He's speaking for himself right now. To plead the fifth. Therefore, while Mr. Kelly does not object to using first names, he does assert that the, to the extent that some of the minor's last names and identifying information is already widely known, it was not through his own public disclosure. So he's saying that please don't make it look like we're, we're using new minors, that we're saying that these are new individuals that are being that are coming forth that these are the same old people from the 2008 trial okay mr kelly has no objection um to refraining from eliciting disclosure of the addresses names of family members and places of employment of the alleged minors minor one's mother or lisa van allen individual d as to the government's request that the sent that the court enter the attached protection order mr kelly agrees to a protective order that corresponds to points one through three supra motion at five so he's protecting himself he's saying to him he's saying to the court listen Lion Weber. I'm not trying to cause no friction here. I'm not trying to sit up here and say that this is, you know, I'm accusing her or she's lying or whatever. It's just that I'm going to be able to speak my piece now before you guys contradict or flip what I have to say. Number two, motion to preclude evidence of victim sexual history. Citing to rules 412A and 403, 
the motion asked for an order precluding, meaning going before defendants from eliciting on cross-examination or otherwise introducing evidence or making arguments as to the sexual behavior of the victim witnesses with individuals other than Kelly or others at Kelly's discretion, at Kelly's direction, as well as any evidence of any purported sexual predisposition, motions at six and seven. At the outset, Mr. Kelly has no intention of introducing any evidence of victim witnesses sexual behavior for the purpose of establishing sexual predisposition. That said, the prior sexual behavior of the victim or victims may be relevant to questions surrounding sexual uh, consensual sex acts with Mr. Kelly when the victim witnesses were not minors. Indeed, Mr. Kelly maintains as to certain victim minors, he never has sexual contact with them when they were minors. So he's getting it out of the way now. So he's telling them, listen, these people are going to sit here and try to lie to you. But I'm telling you, from my own point of view, and I'm telling you, these, these people were not minors when they were sexually involved with Robert Sylvester Kelly. He's telling them this. He's putting it on the docket. Bonjean has put it out there. So now, according to Mr. Kelly, Accordingly, Mr. Kelly objects to the exclusion of one, any evidence regarding sexual conduct of witnesses who are not alleged victims identified in the indictment, meaning don't bring nobody else into this situation because these people lying on me, they're not being forthcoming, they're just saying, I don't know why they're saying this stuff, but he's going to object. Any evidence that falls within the exceptions laid out in Rule 412B and 3, any exclusion based on Rule 403 that is not narrowly tailored to protect Mr. Kelly's Sixth Amendment rights, they're going to object. As a preliminary matter, the motion is not clear as to who the alleged victim witnesses are that the government asked for this reply, this ruling to apply to. The voluminous Discovery in this case involves many women who purportedly had sex with Mr. Kelly who are not identified in the superseding indictment, many of whom were legally able to consent and others for whom the, pro the proffer evidence provides a genuine dispute as their age at the time of the sexual acts, meaning some of the people lied, some of the people have fake IDs. We can't bring that up. We don't need to bring that up because he's saying that this is what it was. He was there. So to the extent that the motion asks for the court to preclude cross-examination or evidence regarding witnesses who are not identified in the superseding indictment, it should be squarely rejected, meaning that we're not going to give you the ammunition to point the finger at what we have on our side. We're going to let you go ahead and cross, we, we will cross examine the evidence regarding the witnesses that are not identified in the indictment, meaning don't bring your other 48 people. Don't bring them from the docuseries. It should be squarely rejected because rule 412's express terms apply only to the witnesses who are victims and because the government has not explained how adult females who had consensual sex are victims. So they have a weakness. The prosecution has a big gap. It's motion in limine pertaining to evidence of other sexual conduct of these witnesses should be denied. Look up United States versus Ray, 2013, U.S. District, Lexis, 202505 at asterisk 8. August 23rd, 2013. This is where they got their ruling. And if you look at that case, you'll see what they're saying in the connection to it. I'm not going to cross move it because I'm trying to get through this motion here. In addition, the government ascertain that all evidence of sexual conduct of minor one, three, four, five, and six is inadmissible. 
under Rule 412 is unavailing. Under Rule 412B and C, evidence of specific instances of a victim's sexual behavior are admissible to prove consent and where exclusion would violate defendant's constitutional rights. Look up Federal Rule Evidence 412B and C. Now, according, courts have admitted evidence that involves sexual conduct for purposes unrelated to sexual predisposition, such as establishing that a victim lied about her age and for arguing that allegations of sexual abuse are false based on history of making false allegations. We want to connect the case of Ray 2013 U.S. District Lexus 20 2505 at asterisk 6. Look up Jenkins 636 Federal Rule 3D 329 356 257 7th Circuit in 2011. To mount a defense against the government's extensive allegations, some of which date back almost 30 years, Mr. Kelly must be permitted to introduce evidence and make arguments that would impeach claims of minority, assert a mistake of age, or establish a timeline among other defenses. So they're about to put their timeline in order. And what does that mean? That means that all the people that sat back and said, this happened, that happened, this happened, that happened, they better have the, the best information, okay? Similarly, the government's sweeping claim that any injury or evidence related to victims' sexual history should be excluded under Rule 403 is unsupported and premature. Look at the motion at 8. When evidence is relevant and otherwise admissible, exclusion should be narrowly tailored and the procedural effect of the offered evidence must substantially outweigh its probative value. So they looked up U.S. versus Hamzy, 986 FD, Federal 3D, 1048, 7th Circuit, 2021, and U.S. versus Buckner. So they have their case law, they have their studies, they've done their research. Mm -hmm. Bonjean is on it. <clears throat> She's on it. Consequently, it is not enough for the government merely to claim that any evidence of any sexual conduct would be marginal at best, where the admission of specific instances may be necessary to secure Mr. Kelly's rights under the Confrontation Clause. So they use the, con the Confrontation Clause is you can't just put people up on a stand and point him out and crucify him in that courtroom. Rejecting prejudice argument under Rule 403 and admitting complaints, past allegations of sexual abuse because in order to confront the complainant effectively to elucidate the facts and legal issues here in question fully and to present a defense in a constitutionally viable trial. So we have to be fair here because we weren't fair in the federal trial. We were not fair in Judge Donnelly's courtroom. Defendant must be allowed to set before the jury the pro offered evidence. So you have to look at what we're saying. You can't just continue to um, sidebar us. The jury... Uh, before the jury, okay, we, defendant must be allowed to set before the jury the pro-offered evidence of ulterior motives. He has to, to he, there, he's going to share, but he's, he's saying, I'm going to share with you if you allow me to speak. If you allow me the opportunity, I will speak, or I will speak through my attorney to where you must listen. There's a lot of ulterior motives in this case. The government sweeping 403 argument, which attempts to broadly exclude evidence that is explicitly admissible under Rule 412 must be rejected. 
So now they're going in saying, if the rule applies, you can't just say, I'm gonna let it fly. You have to do what you know you need to do and you have to do it decently. You have to do it in order for this to come out victoriously for whoever, whether whatever side. OK, and we're not just saying Mr. Robert Sylvester Kelly side or, you know, the lady side. It's the truth, the truth of the matter. Finally, the government statement that Mr. Kelly must submit a motion under 412C1 before introducing certain evidence with regard to the alleged victims is not in dispute. That's what the law requires that he does. He sets it out there. Mr. Kelly has every intention of complying with the federal rule of evidence, including 412C1 and will provide notice as required by the rules. But he's telling them to follow the rules. You set the rules, you set the stage, you set the guidelines. So you can't come in here and just sidebar me. You know, you can't do that at every turn when I'm trying to tell my side of the story because I was there, you know, he was there. Number three, motion to bar evidence and argument related to consent. By their own statements, all but one of the alleged minors had engaged in a sexual relationship with Mr. Kelly while they were consenting adults. In addition, the entirety of the sexual acts charged in the superseding indictment took place between 19 and 26 years ago. The ages of the alleged minors and veracity of claims about their age at remote points in time are central important parts to the case. So much so that providing any of the alleged minors was old enough to consent would be a complete defense to all counts involving all minor alleged minors. While Mr. Kelly does not intend to argue that minors are legally able to consent to sexual acts with adults, he objects to excluding evidence and arguments relating to the consent because he cannot be precluded from arguing that the alleged minors were old enough to consent. So basically he's saying, I have permission to do the things that I did. If I did them and if I admit to doing them, I'm gonna break it down to you and tell you how it was done. Whether they had the fake IDs, whether they had the um, parental consent, whether they had those um, areas of the false IDs, that's the biggest one, that's the biggest one. Re relatedly, Mr. Kelly objects to the government's motion to the extent it seeks to prevent Mr. Kelly from refuting the government's proof of inducement, meaning show me your proof to prove offenses under the age of eight, under 18 U.S. Code Section 2251A and 18 U.S.C. Code 2422B. The government must prove that Mr. Kelly knowingly, now, this is where we're at, okay, let's see. This is where we're at. When we say knowingly, I think I was on page, excuse me. Um, what page is that? Okay, so <clears throat> while Mr. Kelly concedes that consent is not a defense at 2251 or 2422 offenses, it is also true that sexually explicit conduct with a minor is not per se evidence of inducement. He didn't in induce that. Put differently, the government is not relieved of its burden of proving inducement simply because it establishes sexually explicit conduct with the minor. Mr. Kelly must be permitted to challenge evidence of inducement, which may require cross-examining the minors about their conduct, not to demonstrate consent, but to negate inducement. To the extent that the government attempts to prevent Mr. Kelly from challenging inducement, he objects to this motion. So let's look up inducement. So when we say inducement, inducement defined. Here's the definition of inducement, a thing that persuades or influences someone to do something. So 
they're, they're saying here that if you don't allow us to cross-examine the minors, then the government, if they prevent that, he's going to object to this motion. Number four, motion to prevent the public display of child pornography during trial. Look at the morality that is in this document right here. Mr. Kelly joins the motion to prevent the publication of video clips allegedly containing child pornography to the gallery during trial. Meaning, no, we're not going to do it your way by allowing you to show child pornography when you just told me that I'm on trial for it. You're not going to use that opportunity in in my to defend for me to defend what you have to say about me. It's not going to happen. So that's good that they actually put that motion in there to prevent that because yeah child pornography is child pornography whether you're watching it in trial or what it's still child pornography number five government's intended evidence of polygraph examinations without conceding any of the arguments in the motion mr kelly acknowledged the government's intent to present testimony and docu documents of polygraph examinations allegedly so this is alleged now, since when does polygraph exams be allowed in court? You know, um, let's see here. Taken by the witnesses in this case. To the extent the government intends to introduce the fact that polygraph exams were used by defendant McDavid in support of his obstruction charge, Mr. Kelly does not presently object while reserving his right to object at the time of trial. So right now we could put it out there, but if it is something that comes up that's detrimental to the point where you can't really prove it, we're not going to we're not going to allow you to present that. We're not going to allow we're going to strike it. Okay? That said, Mr. Kelly does not object to testimony about the result of the polygraphs and the introduction of questions presented during the polygraph exams. Any substantive use of the polygraph exams that would bolster any government witnesses, testimony should be prohibited as both unreliable and unduly prejudicial. Absolutely, because you can't, polygraphs don't hold up in court. That's what I remember from school. It didn't hold up. The government fails to explain why it would need to present testimony from the polygrapher when the individuals who were allegedly subjected to the polygraph exams can simply testify about having participated in the polygraph exam to the extent the court permits the polygrapher the polygrapher to testify the testimony should be limited solely to establishing that the polygraph examination occurred yeah so he's saying you're not going to go in deeper to find something that is not legally binding to me i mean that is what it is was it what it was so notice regarding introduction of the false records alleged in the superseding indictment mr kelly objects to the introduction of the memorandum prepared in connection with statements made by individual d At least i know that's lisa van allen on relevance ground the government alleges that mr kelly And defendant McDavid caused individual D to make a false statement to private attorneys who then memorialized those statements in some type of memorandum that was provided to the Cook County State Attorney's Office in 2008 and eventually made its way to the office of the United States Attorney. As a matter of law, this memorandum is not relevant evidence since the government has pro-offered no evidence that Kelly or McDavid created the memorandum or made the false statements contained in the memorandum. Mr. Ke Kelly contends that to sustain a conspiracy to commit a violation of U.S. Code 18 um, of 1519, the government must show that Mr. Kelly or a co-conspirator make the false entry or false statement. It is not sufficient to show that they persuaded another to do so. That's hearsay. 
Moreover, the government has pro-offered no evidence that individual D herself had any knowledge that a memorandum was being prepared in connection with her alleged statements and shared with the state prosecutors who would eventually share it with federal prosecutors more than a decade later. Now, in short, the creation of this memorandum cannot, as matter of law, constitute a false record, meaning that it was just communication and a communication uh, went over into a, a uh, memo, um, uh, like a motion. They didn't know what it was going to turn into. So she was being, I guess, persuaded by gender goddess or someone. In short, the creation of this memorandum cannot, as a matter of law, constitute a false record, nor is there any evidence that suggests that it was prepared with the knowledge of any the defendants or even individual D knew about. Relatedly, Mr. Kelly objects to the introduction of any police report that allegedly contains false statements of minor one. Such evidence is irrelevant for establishing that Mr. Kelly or any co-conspirator made false entries in any record or document. As stated above, even assume the government can demonstrate that Mr. Kelly persuaded minor one to make false statements to law enforcement, such evidence would be irrelevant to the question of whether Kelly and any of his co-conspirators made false entries in any record. Notice of intent to admit direct evidence of crimes charged. The government's notice of intent conflates providing its case with asking for a carte blanche. So it's asking for a immunity and that's not good. So you're gonna give them the okay to say whatever they say and it's not gonna be, they're not gonna be charged for any of this stuff. So the notice of intent to admit direct evidence of crimes charged, the government's notice provides its case will ask for a carte blanche to introduce inflammatory evidence suggesting that Mr. Kelly had a violent and abusive character. Specifically, it plans to introduce evidence of physical, emotional, and sexual abuse of minors one, three, four, five, and six for purposes of showing enticement and coercion necessary for 2422B charge and as direct evidence of Supreme of um, course code 371 charge, the motion 2425 of that charge. While some of this evidence might be relevant, Mr. Kelly objects to admission of any evidence that is not directly relevant to the crimes charge, meaning he is not going to He's going to object to everything that is not specifically what is on the um, on the docket. Prosecution can't bring nothing new into this. They cannot do it, or he's going to object. Whose probative value is substantially outweighed by a danger of unfair prejudice. Look up federal evidence four o three. Critically, the government the government has provided. A couple of examples of evidence of violence it seeks to introduce, but has failed to put Mr. Kelly on sufficient notice of what specific acts of violence it intends to offer. So he is going deep. He is going hard. He is going into everything that they say that they're going to put on the books. That's it. It won't be no surprises, nothing used as evidence that could, you know, harm him in this case, which makes sense because this is sim similarly a double jeopardy, double jeopardy case. Allegations of acts of violence that were not intended to induce interstate travel for sex are relevant to the elements of 2422B. Similarly, acts of violence that are unrelated to the conspiracy charges are not relevant. Don't bring them up. Where minor one alleged that she had a long-term relationship with Mr. Kelly, which continued for nearly 10 years after she became an adult and for several years after she allegedly made false statements exonerating him on previous charges. Not every allegation of violence during a 15-year period will prove the elements of the code 
371. See generally United States versus Ingram in 2018, U.S. District Lexis 185201. Excluding testimony that co defendant participated in crime because of domestic violence by a defendant where the fact didn't did no nothing where where that fact did nothing to prove elements of armed robbery okay similarly acts of alleged abuse by mr kelly are not proof of a conspiracy and it is not convincible that every act of dating violence or other violence against the alleged victims relates to obstruction of justice now in that he's saying i'm going to tell my part i'm going to tell my truth i'm going to say well you know maybe we did get into a domestic situation maybe we did yell a little bit maybe you know we we lay hands or you know but it was e equally you know what i mean expressing concerns about the relevance of specific incidents of, of violence on the part of individual co-conspirators that were not evidence of concerted action in a RICO analysis. He is setting himself in a position where they, if they had a given Bonjean the time, the same thing would have been set up in the federal trial. Definitely. We're halfway done. Okay. Even for evidence of alleged abuse, that has, been, has some relevance, the court should conduct an analysis under Rule 403 on an individualized basis to ensure that the evidence is not over, overly cumulative or prejudicial, particularly where the 13 count superseding indictment strings together charges that are unrelated in time, involve different alleged victims, and require proof of distinct facts that could allow for extensive and drawn out testimony, there's a strong potential that the abuse evidence, the government references will end up serving as a prejudicial propensity evidence. And remember, we went over that at the beginning. To avoid this risk, the court should delineate uh, precisely the legitimate ends to which the evidence could be applied and allow the use of other act evidence only when it's admissible and is supported by some propensity free chain of reasoning. So what they're saying is, come on, the Gomez uh, ruling states that, you know, you have to have factual evidence and everything has to be aligned. You can't just be throwing in things to be heard for prosecution and jury to hear that, you know, is not legitimate for the act that is being applied in this rule 403. And it makes sense. There's a strong potential that the abuse evidence, the government references will end up serving as prejudicial propensity evidence. They're gonna use it to maneuver and manipulate what has been said in bringing all the crimes together from both the federal side and the Chicago side. And it's just, whew, it would be too much. It would be far too much. And it is prejudicial based on Gomez, um, that law. And I didn't study Lee, but I'm going to go and look that law up to United States versus Lee. Motion for prior notice concerning Rule 608 impeachment without any authority whatsoever. The government audaciously moves this court to put a gag order on Mr. Kelly's defense by barring impeachment evidence, including by asking questions on cross-examining examination, except under prior notice to the court and the opposing party outside the presence of the jury. Mm, motion at 26. That's that's weird. It is unconverted that there is no general requirement that either side give notice of impeachment evidence. While there is no obligation on the government to provide notice of intent to use prior bad acts evidence under Rule 404B, Rule 608 does not contain the same requirement. So Bonjean is telling the prosecution, check your evidence, check your case law. 
because you're using it wrong. And, you know, the prior bad acts evidence under this rule is not the same requirement as it is under, you know, rule 404B. One in a line of Second Circuit cases saying no notice is required under Rule 608 or 609. So basically, they don't have to give a required notice. They're, they're really, prosecution is really afraid about what R. Kelly is going to share now um, because he's been so quiet this whole time. In the federal trial, he's been quiet. In this trial, he has Bonjean. So they want to know every move, every stick move he's going to make so they can know how to rebut that because they don't want any surprises because they know what their goal is. And it's sad before he even goes to trial. It's very sad. To defend himself, Mr. Kelly must be allowed to expose bias of government Witnesses through the use of impeachment evidence. Yeah, immunity. These people have immunity. They're not going to get punished for anything they say, even if, if there's an appeal and there is some bad act evidence that's being pro promoted here. It's just like a witch hunt again. But Bonjean is saying no. Exposing witness bias is at the core of the confrontation right. And according to the Seventh Circuit, bias is one of the five acceptable methods of attacking the credibility of a witness's testimony, attacking the witness's general character for truthfulness, showing that prior to trial, the witness had made statements inconsistent with his testimony, showing that the witness is biased, showing that the witness has an impaired capacity to perceive. Recall or relate the event about which he is testifying and contradicting the substance of the witness's testimony. These years have gone by so fast for R. Kelly. He wasn't, he probably wasn't even present mentally when all this stuff was going on. The admissibility of evidence attacking credibility is limited only by the relevant standard of rule 402. So if that's the rule that you're saying that we have to follow, then we need to look at the federal practices and procedures under the code 6092 from 1990, around the time that all of this was taking place. Precedence, that's his precedence, okay? This court should reject the government's bald attempt to preempt Positively bolster the credibility of its witnesses, more than a few of whom had made prior inconsistent statements under oath and deny its novel motive for notice of impeachment outside the presence of the jury. Oh, so now we're talking about, okay, if you want to cross-examine, let's cross-examine. If you want to bring new things in, then we're going to take everything from the timeline to the uh, the impeachment, you know, or perjury that they've already announced and they will have to re communicate and they're not going to be able to do that communication the correct, effective way. Why? Because these things were coached over years and now they may slip up and say something wrong. So that's why uh, Robert is saying in his motion, this is what I want. They made prior inconsistent statements under oath and denied its novel motion for notice of impeachment outside the presence of the jury. They did that without the jury knowing that that's what they had done. So number nine, motion to preclude argument designed to elicit jury nullification. The motion asked to preclude evidence or argument that is characterizes as designed to elicit jury nullification, including that of A, penalties faced by defendants if they are convicted, outrageous government conduct, government's motivation in prosecuting the case, and selective prosecuting, prosecution. Selective prosecution, that is where it is straight prejudicial. 
Kelly has no intention to argue jury nullification and objects only to the extent that he intends to expose every weakness in the government's case. That's all he's doing. He's not trying to bring any new evidence. He's not even trying to use the fact, I believe, when I read this before, he's not even trying to use his disability in this situation, even though he could. But he's not even trying to do that. Mr. Kelly has no intention to argue jury nullification and objects only to the extent that he intends to expose every weakness in the government's case, including the government's conduct and tactics that affect the veracity and the truth of the reliability of evidence. You go, Kells. You go. Preclude discovery request or commentary regarding discovery and presence of jury. Mr. Kelly does not intend to have discovery disputes in front of the jury and questions whether the government is anticipating not having produced all of the discovery. So he's saying, I'm, I'm, not, gonna, I'm, 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 I'm not gonna tell the jury something to make the prosecution look bad in and of itself, but don't try to do it to me as well. He's saying, just let's go in there with the sense of balance, balancing the fulcrum. You know, the criminal justice system must be balanced. Must be balanced. Government produces undisclosed evidence at trial. Mr. Kelly's counsel cannot promise to act unsurprised but will conduct herself appropriately so meaning she's going to prove and she's going to let it be known that this is new number 11 exclude evidence or arguments regarding the constitutionality of the statutes criminalizing the production and receipt of child pornography mr kelly has no objection number 12 preclude argument or evidence of defendants non Pertinent character traits. Mr. Kelly has every intention of abiding by the federal rules of evidence and reserves the right to introduce relevant and probative evidence at trial. So he probably will talk or Bonjean will use exhibits to show and timeline of what is really, really going on. Defendant does not intend to affirmatively introduce evidence of good character. So he's not going to try to make himself look good. He's just going to bring it right as it is, straight raw. 13, preclude defense of alibi, unavailability, and mental defect. With regard to alibi evidence under Rule 12.1, it is currently impossible for Mr. Kelly to provide an alibi because the government's allegations identify almost no specific date and span at least 20 years. So good, he's not going to perjure himself by trying to make himself look good with the oldest approximation placed somewhere in the mid 90s. If it becomes clear at trial that Mr. Kelly has an alibi defense, he will very well raise it. So if it jogs his memory and he goes back and says, oh, dude was there with me. Oh, I remember da 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 da. I remember, you know, doing a, a video with Kirk Franklin. He was in the, in, in, in the room at a certain time, you know, or whatever. At this juncture, it is not possible for Mr. Kelly to provide notice of an alibi when he himself has no notice of the times or dates he may have one for. Mr. Kelly is not planning to raise mental defect under Rule 12 too, so he's not trying to do anything to make himself look totally good. It's just, it is what it is. And number 14, preclude defense counsel from defining term reasonable doubt. Mr. Kelly has no response to this motion and states that he is represented by experienced, okay now, all right, <laughs> come on with it, experienced, experienced counsel who will represent him competently. So he don't have to use the fact that he's mentally challenged. Bonjean got him. 15, allow government to recall case agent during case in chief. Mr. Kelly objects to the government's open-ended motion to episodically recall its own investigator. While Mr. Kelly does not dispute that it is within the court's discretion to exercise reasonable control over the mode and order of examining witnesses under 611A, recalling a witness an untold number of times presents a serious risk. Prejudicial overemphasis on the witnesses 
credibility and undue lengthening of the trial. So, you know, let's not draw this out. Let's get right to the point. You know what I'm saying? Don't try to, if I'm not trying to make myself look good, then don't try to make your people look like they're straight victims. Okay, let's keep it real. Acknowledging the risk is that one side is given an unfair opportunity to strengthen this case as well as perhaps unduly emphasize certain testimony when a witness is recalled. Consequently, Mr. Kelly objects to the government's motion and asks that the court use its discretion appropriately and limit the agent's testimony to prevent undue emphasis and keep the trial as balanced as possible. Amen. That's all we're asking. And 16, admit business records. Mr. Kelly has no objection to the admission of certified copies of domestic business records pursuant to rules 90311 and 8036 contingent on the government's agreement for reciprocity when and if Mr. Kelly seeks to introduce the same. See motion at 40. Mr. Kelly reserves the right to object on relevance grounds. Conclusion. For the foregoing reasons, defendant seeks an order from this court denying numbers 2, 3, 5, 7, 8, and 15 of the government's motion and granting the motion with respect to number 4. Respectfully submitted, Jennifer Bonjean, Bonjean Law Group, PLLC, 750 Lexington Avenue, 9th floor, New York, New York, 10022-715. 875-1850. And that is the motion. And I wish I could make this live. I wish this could have went live, but it was just too much information. And what I want to say to you all is that I'm telling you, there is going to be the light at the end of the tunnel. It's coming. It's coming. It's coming. Because the majority of things that were involved in this was the setup. This was the ultimate setup. But we're okay now. We're here. There was something I wanted to leave you all with. Oh, this Sunday, we will take the re remaining portion of questions, comments, anything you have to feel after you have listen to this motion hearing after the um, prosecution put out the or not the prosecution but a, um judge lion weber when he put out the protective order which was of course induced by the prosecution there's a lot that had to go with this so right now i do believe that r kelly is coming out of his unmuteness and that's a good possibility that even if he does not speak, Bonjean knows it all. So there's everything in it. He's not even trying to glorify himself. He's not even trying to point the finger and say, but they lied on me. They lied on me. And you know, there's a time and there's a place when things happen. It's just like the story of Joseph and his brothers and how they, they put that, that lie to his father and told their father that Joseph was dead, but it took Joseph to go to a whole another country or another location. And for those same brothers who tried to kill him, he was victoriously uplifted. And in this victorious of upliftment, he ended up having to feed and take care and employ those who lied against him who disrespected him. And on top of that, when we're in that position, do we say, oh, that's a liar over there. Oh, she did me wrong. Do R. Kelly do all that? Do he, does, does Robert Sylvester Kelly now need to do all that, even though he has had many who have won against him? Okay, even look at the crucifixion, you know? These people lied. These people lied again. And again, a public display of nakedness, embarrassment, turmoil, 
rebuke, mental illness. And this shows how people in society treat the powers that be treat basic everyday people. If they can do this to their own. Whoa, well, but God can go either anyone. So this is the reason why I'm bringing this up and putting the motions on. Um, I think this was a good position and we'll sit back and we'll figure out what's going on with the uh, with the motions. Now, this Sunday, the um, let me see here. When will I be back on live? I'm going to go live this Sunday, July the 31st, and we're going to have responses from this motion since this is not live it was too long and i needed to stay focused so um we're going to have some questions some q a's on some opinions on that from my chat box and thank you all again for 300,000 views that means that 300,000 more people know something more about robert sylvester kelly whether they've been tainted by social media or what they know to come to the R. Kelly Appeal TV for some reason. So I really and truly thank everyone for that. Please hit the like button and please share the videos so that other people will know that it exists, you know. Um, and I will also um, be doing a backstory to the R. Kelly Appeal channel i don't know what i'm going to put on it um but it will be a um intimate conversation about the producer of the r kelly appeal tv so um it won't be more or less part of the appeal or the or the chicago trial so i if you are not interested you know surely you can find another channel and i'd be grateful that you just come through with the with the appeal portion. Um, but those who want to veer off a little bit and learn more about the intricate workings behind the scene of the R. Kelly Appeal TV um, channel, the feel free to meet me on Sunday at 6 p.m. It will be live. And yes, thank you so much for liking, commenting, sharing, and subscribing. I know this was a lot, but take it in baby steps. And just know that R. Kelly's attorney and the group and the attorneys that is going to be working with him on the Chicago trial is giving us some hope over here at R. Kelly Appeal TV. And for all the supporters, hope is what we need. Thank you so much. God bless you. You stay safe. And as always, keep it 100. And we will see you next time.